Hello, welcome to Life Together in a Post-Christian Culture. Uh, this is Lesson 3, and in Lesson 3 we're going to be transitioning from the conceptual idea of what a worldview is, the fact that we all have one at some level working in the background of, of all that we do, uh, and this idea of truth. You know, we embrace uh, a Kingdom of God worldview. Uh, we as a church believe that there is absolute true truth. Uh, and we define that as, as what is contained in Scripture and what is uh, entrusted to reliable witnesses, those who've seen it. So, we, so in this lesson, we're going to transition from that conceptual work to, to more of the daily life teaching. Uh, the, the key text for this will be the last uh, few verses of Ecclesiastes 12 where, where Solomon, the man who's experienced everything, says, so this is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. So Solomon is claiming that I, I've seen it all, I've experienced it all, I've pursued uh, a life of folly, I've pursued wisdom, I've pursued advancement, I've pursued riches, I've pursued women and sex, I, I, I've seen it all. And at the end of the day, the, the whole duty of man is to fear God and keep His commandments. Um... In a real sense, through this whole book, Solomon is, is claiming a worldview, a way to see the way things operate truly. Um, when you read and hear the word, fear the words, fear God and keep his commandments, very often when we hear commandments, we're thinking about the Ten Commandments that Moses brought down from Sinai, and certainly that's that's included in this thought, but uh, but we believe that, that commandments is is uh, is larger than just a list of rules. When Solomon says, fear God and keep his commandments, he's referring uh, almost in an iconic sense of the Torah itself, the, the, the law that contains the laws that we talk about, those 300 plus uh, regulations and such. So, so Solomon had in mind, fear God and keep his commandments. He was reading Torah. He was reading those first five books of our Bible. It, they would memorize them. It was very important to their everyday life. And so when he was saying that, that would be what he was most likely referring to. And so as, as you, if you go back and look at the way Ecclesiastes 1 began, I think you're going to see that there are some direct parallels between Genesis 1, 2, and 3 uh, and the, what Solomon is claiming to be a biblical worldview. And Lamar touched on this when he when he opened up the series. But in, in chapter 1, verse 15, it says, What is twisted cannot be straightened, and what is lacking cannot be counted. Right out of the blocks, Solomon is saying that we live in a world that is, that is twisted, and no matter how we try, in the flesh, uh, apart from an intervention of God, it cannot be made straight. Where, where is he getting that idea? Well, we, we get that clue at the end of the book where he says, Fear God and keep his commandments. Genesis 1, 2, and 3. When we, we read about this, this seeking of man to be like God that led to a fall, it, it unraveled everything. It, it unraveled creation. Scripture says that, that creation groans and longs for a day when it's, it's renewed. Our relationships... They become twisted. No longer do we live in a world where um, it's safe. We live in a world where we, we're always looking over our shoulder. We always feel we, we have to self-protect and preserve ourselves. The world is truly twisted. And, and, and the fact, well, the reality that that is fact shapes all the world. So Solomon is making a clear worldview. Referring to those, to the Torah, those commandments, the teachers and Pharisees of the law asked Jesus, they said, so, so Jesus, who, what is the, what's the most important commandment? What's the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, I don't know if you remember this, but Jesus said, fear God and love your neighbor. And he says, all the others hinge on those two. Fear God and, and love others. Does that not sound a lot like Ecclesiastes 12? Fear God and keep his commandments. 
Jesus was saying that the way to truly find life is to orient yourself with a worldview that God established in Genesis, that Solomon testified in Ecclesiastes, that, that biblical writers you see unfolding this worldview in, in more depth up until the time of Jesus. And so as your group wrestles with this idea, what does it mean to fear God? What does it mean to love God? What does it mean to, to love your neighbor? Wrestle with what the implications are for that. Can, can I love you without giving? Yeah, of course I can. There's a, there's a cost involved, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. So, so as you wrestle with that, that verse in your home group session, uh, really, really help them think through the implications of fearing God and loving others. Later on in Jesus' uh, or, or part of his, his mission on earth, he was talking to his disciples, and, and he told his disciples that, that, that I want you to go where I'm going to go. And Thomas, the literalist, almost asking, uh, you know, uh, like a Google map direction, uh, well, how do you get there? Like Jesus was going to the mall. And, and, and Thomas said, but, but we don't even know the way. I don't even know the way where you're going. And Jesus makes a claim. He makes an authority claim and he makes a worldview claim. Jesus says, he says three things. I am the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. A worldview, and it, as we hinge uh, in this lesson from talking conceptually about worldview to a way to live, um, Jesus is claiming that there is a way to live if you truly fear God, and love others. He, he makes a, a really strong claim that, in fact, I am the embodiment of that way. You'll, you hear that called an ethic, a way to live based on a way of thinking. Jesus said, I am that way. He goes on to say, I am the truth. So he's not only the a living, breathing example of, of a kingdom of God worldview that leads to an ethic. He is also the embodiment of the very truth of God himself. You know, we said that truth is uh, determined by a reliable, faithful witness. Our, our scriptures are just that. It's a faithful witness of, of the history of God and his people. But Jesus himself, when he says, I am the truth, is, is there a more faithful witness than Christ himself? He was there at creation. Uh, John clearly says that, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He is the ultimate faithful witness. And so he claims, I am an embodiment of the way to live, and I am an embodiment of the truth itself. And then he goes on to say the third thing. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and I am the life. If you think about what Solomon's saying in Ecclesiastes, he, he's saying life is meaningless. And Jesus says, apart from me, the embodiment of, of, of a meaningful life, Solomon would be right. In other words, if, if you want to find a life of significance, a life that isn't meaningless or, or vain, you live the way of Christ with the truth of Christ in you, and you find what you what you long for. Help your group begin to see how important those three words are that Jesus used. He didn't use them haphazardly. He had a he had a really important reason for using them. Those are uh, I almost can't overstate that enough. All right. So the, we'll end this lesson with uh, Matthew sixteen uh, twenty four through twenty seven. And as you, as you read that text, uh, I'm going to ask you to read it almost side by side. Have Ecclesiastes 12 and have Matthew 16. Uh, read it parallel. And I want you to begin to see some similarities about what we're called to do, what life, how to really find life, and then at the end, all that is crooked will be straightened all that's done will be exposed both jesus and solomon make this claim but jesus so so once you see those similarities then we need to ask ourselves well, what does it mean 
to really adhere to what Jesus said in, in chapter 16, verse 24 and 27. Because what he says is, if you want to follow me, you've got to lose your life. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. In other words, you've got to lose your life and follow me. Um, in my sermon, I'm probably going to use this illustration. I'm going to give it to you uh, fairly briefly. I'll, I'll flesh it out more in the sermon. But there's, a, there's an instructor at Syracuse University who uh, for years had lived in a lesbian lifestyle. She was pretty radical. She was anti-Christian. She was actually writing a story to expose Christianity in a sense. And she, she began to, to rub shoulders with some Christians. And what she found was that this way of Christ began to seem important to her. And the more she was around the community of God, the more she realized that she needed what this community had. And so she talks about how as she was being converted, as she was beginning to live around Christians, um, at the same time this was going on, she had a lesbian, transgender lover who uh, she was living with. It was her partner. And on Sunday mornings as she would enter into this Christian community, she says, I had to leave the bed of my lesbian lover and walk into a Christian culture. And she says something very interesting. She says, as Christians, we get sucked into this debate about am, are, are homosexuals born this way? And she said, well, let me, let me just say matter-of-factly, I was born this way. And so are you. In other words, she, she wasn't saying we're all homosexual. What she was saying was, because of this worldview that, that, that Solomon articulated and Genesis articulated, we live in a perverted world when, where the wrong seems right and the right seems wrong. And I was born that way. I was born with a, with a natural tendency to pursue perverted relationships. And she said, and so are you. Maybe it's not homosexuality. Maybe it's a perverted relationship with money. Maybe it's a perverted relationship with, with power. Maybe you are struggling with a perverted version of sexuality. But she said, every Sunday I went to church, I had to give up that tendency to follow Christ. And so I was born that way, and, and we all are. We're all born in the flesh with a desire to pursue what's twisted. It's, it's very compelling, and it, it breaks down the whole argument. It's a, it's a game changer for our culture. Let's not get sucked into that conversation. Let's affirm, yeah, you were born that way, and it's going to lead to death. It's a great conversation. I, I encourage you... Uh, we're going to end this lesson with a pointed question. Uh, I'll just read it. It says, is there anything specifically you'd like to share with your group that you're struggling with giving up? I want to challenge you as a leader of that group to be authentic and transparent and vulnerable about your own struggle with things that God is calling you to give up. Money may be too important to you. It certainly is to me. I wrestle with it every day. Um, I try to squeeze a nickel out of a penny. Um, it's too important to me, and I wrestle with that all the time. I think something I wrestle with even more than that is a desire to be right. Um, I had to confess to a Bible study this past week. A question was asked, and I immediately got on the defensive. The question was a great question. It was a very thought-provoking question. But because of this twisted, perverted a uh, heart that God is slowly transforming, um, He convicted me of, of, of my own sense of, of defense and my need to be right to win an argument. And I just confessed it to them. I interrupted my own self midstream and said, I just got to gotta admit, this is where I am. Um, you need to be doing similar things with your group. You need to lead out in this vulnerability because I do believe that if we as a church and if the people of God will approach this worldview topic not just conceptually but by executing uh, tough life decisions. We can change our church culture uh, which uh, have great influence on our city. 
I hope that's a help. Again, if you have any questions, contact me. Uh, I'm going to include a link to the video uh, I just discussed. It's about an hour long. You may not have a chance to watch it. Watch part of it, if you will. It's, it's very enlightening, and I think it will help inform your conversation. Thank you for all you do. I'm praying for you, and I hope uh, you have a great week with your home group.